Mutual Cultural Empathy with Dr. Ivana Draskovic. So Ivana, thank you for again for agreeing to talk with me. And um, in this particular chapter, we've been looking at connection and disconnection and the importance of mutual cultural empathy. And so I am inviting you to talk a little bit about your perspective on um, what it's like to build that sense of cultural empathy with clients. Okay, well, that's a really good question because I, was, I just had a thought when you were asking uh, that question. And I thought, you know, we talk about this in our classes when we teach and uh, oftentimes people will say, well, yeah, that's all great, but how do I put it in perspective? And uh, when I think about what it means to build mutual cultural empathy, I go back in my mind in Bosnia, where I grew up. And I grew up in a neighborhood where uh, Christian Orthodox people, Catholic people, Jewish people, and uh, uh, Muslim people lived together. Um, those little neighborhoods were called Mahalas, and Mahala uh, means almost, I don't know the exact translation of the word, but we often talk about these small communities where people talk to each other, support each other, know each other, and respect each other's differences. So I grew up celebrating all of the holidays, mm. Christian Orthodox Christmas, Easter, Saints, you know, Catholic Easter, uh, Ramadan, all of that. And um, I've never witnessed, um, I've witnessed conflict, but I've never witnessed disrespect for, for each other's experiences. And so when I work with people and when I wanna understand where they come from, that's the image that I bring back in my mind, the smell of that Ramadan bread, um, you know, the smells of uh, bivax candles that uh, Christian Orthodox people light or, or Christmas song. And also remember that, that, you know, there is space for all of us to share our story. So when I sit with a client, I believe that part of building cultural empathy is being there, but it's also being able to reflect what you're hearing through your own experience. We are bombarded with these stories about, oh, reflect meaning, reflect feeling. I mean, we, we mark that, uh, <laughs> those skills in our skills classes, but rarely do we ever really kind of mark uh, the human parts of ourselves. And so my habit is that if clients share something um, from their cultural lived experience that fits with mine and that I've experienced or it's similar to mine, uh, my habit is to blur that out back to them and say, hey, you know, um, that's very similar to what we do in our culture and this is what we do and that's how we build this conversation and with that we build relationships. Because oftentimes uh, in subsequent sessions people will come and say, like you said last time, what you do, we do that, but um, you know it's a little bit different. And so there's a culture of sharing in, in sessions that's much more important than just delivering an intervention. So uh, I think the most important thing that I've learned from myself working as a counselor in my research with refugee women is that we need to be ourselves, we need to be able to build a relationship on a human level, and yet, Building therapeutic relationship for self disclosure has been, and humor, because I, I'm quite bold in my jokes, has been two things that I have been reprimanded on ever since I entered the counseling world. I have never not been given a talk about my humor, and I have never not been given a talk about my self disclosure. Um, and it comes from a place of not knowing in the Western world. It comes from a place of, you know, not understanding why self-disclosure is so important, why um, reflecting to your client that you're a cultural being who allows them and opens up space for them to be who they are rather than hold back. Um, and it takes me back, like when I say that, opening up, I use that a lot, opening up space, um, leaning into the difference, leaning into your own culturalness. 
and leaning into the client's culturalness. I don't know if that's the word. I tend to make them up. But it takes me back to the last drumming ceremony we had at the beginning of the pandemic. It was the last in-person ceremony we had. There was 50 women. They were placed there. And the habit and the custom is that when we before we drum, we, we socialize and we eat something and we all make something. So I made the beans too. And my friend Randy made the beef stew and there were some other foods there. And I remember all of us sitting, women from everywhere, Korean women, women, Bosnian women, you know, Canadian women, indigenous women from all parts of Canada. And we are commenting on this too. And we're talking to each other about how really, uh, in reality, our stew has the same base. And then we kind of put our little flavors in it. You know, I put my pepper and my vegetable spice and, um, and salt. And then I add paprika and they add something different. And we giggled and laughed and reflected on our experiences and what it meant to be women within our cultures without ever acknowledging necessarily, you know, this is who I am. In, in, in those black and white terms, we were just sharing. And so that's where, what I think multi, uh, mutual cultural empathy is. So sharing with each other, um, knowing where we are similar and when we are different. And we talked about lots about cultural diversity and diversity does not mean difference necessarily. It means that we are diverse. Um, but that we care so much more, that we share the love of land, we share the same herb that our grandmas picked, you know, similar stories and whatnot. And so for me, that's the piece that's really important. And when I when I think about, um, like we talked about in the past about connection and disconnection, and I think when we use therapy skills in prescribed manner without bringing our own lived experience into the world, into that, in, into that relationship. We're, we're not doing what we supposed to do. We, we're coming then from a perspective of privilege, power, this, this already created way of how you need to treat people. For me, it's important that that person feel welcome. Um, I remember reading a chapter, I know you're familiar that um, Carol Sinclair and Susie Bazan and I did that edited book on ethics. And I remember reading uh, um, Matthew Cassatt's chapter where he calls his um, client guests and he offers them tea and he sits down with them and, and, or coffee and he talks with them. And thinking like, this is the kind of world I want to work in where I can offer and get something in return in terms of sharing, not just be this neutral sort of weird sitting therapist. So, so I think it, it's the, um, deconstructing our own ideas of therapy, power, therapeutic relationship. And this is what I talk about when I talk about in in infusing social justice into at the micro level in your session, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I've answered all of your questions, but yeah, I think that's great. It um I love the way that you framed this because it's so much what we're trying to the core message that we're trying to give in this ebook, which is yeah. that none of these skills that sit out here as independent pieces are neutral. Um, they, and how we use them is the thing that's important. And what we're trying to do in this ebook is to say that everything we do is in service of the relationship. Yes. So yeah. the choice in a vacuum, still yeah. in a vacuum. They're not these isolated units of therapy. Mm -hmm. They're connected to each other and they're connected to us. We come from somewhere. We were influenced by our families, peers, and other systems that, that we were exposed to and grew up in and developed. And, and I find that when we are too magnetized, when we are too clean and polished, you know, there's, it's, there's very little space to develop relationships. 
Mm-hmm. I challenge that daily because I don't like being dressed in in business manner. I don't like being uncomfortable. I don't like sitting in a particular way. You know, like I like to be me. Mm-hmm. And anytime I was not me, I have a therapeutic rupture. Mm-hmm. And when I thought that I had therapeutic ruptures when I was me, so with, uh, particularly in, 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 in instances where I use self-disclosure and then I judge myself for using it too early or the client gets upset. And then a few sessions after I get the feedback about, hey, I thought about what you said and it really clicked for me. That's the best gift that you can get as a therapist. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can get that through prescription. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one of the interesting things that you said there, which I just want to highlight as we wrap up here, is that um, part of this is about risk taking on your part and vulnerability yes. on your part, because it's not always going to go perfectly. But yes. you have built a foundation of relationship with the people you're working with where you can say, oh, that didn't actually go that well. So how do we process that? And how do we come back to be broken as a therapist and come back to that room and say, help me understand what happened. How can I be more present, more effective Mm -hmm. in in this relationship with you? Not in my work, in this relationship with you, because that's what matters. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's lovely.